Welcome back to Quantum Conversations. My name is Sarah, and today on this episode, we are sharing with you a preview of our free health transformation summit, which actually starts today if you're watching this live Friday, November the 8th, and runs through November the 14th. Now, the summit is completely free to watch live. We have talks from Alex Zek, from Dr. Laura Conover about grounding, Daniel Hamilton. We did previews of all of those chats on last week's episode. So if you missed that, make sure you go back and watch it. This week's episode, we are doing preview chats of my talk on light and metabolism, Carrie's talk on nervous system and nature. We also have a really good talk about cancer and circadian biology with Zaid and then Mateo from Axiom about hydrogen, which is a really fun chat. So if you enjoy these free little chats here on the podcast, make sure to head down to the show notes to sign up for the summit. It's completely free to watch. We'd love to have you. And then if you want to check out the upgrade package in that upgrade package, we have a few courses worth about $2,000, one of which is going to be my brand new leptin three-day kickstart course, which is not available anywhere else. Carrie's nervous system and nature course, which is not available anywhere else and several, several more that I think you're going to find a great amount of value in. So make sure to head down to the show notes, check that out. We'd love to have you and enjoy this really fun episode where we're showing you a variety of different topics to help you improve your health. I'll talk with you again soon. Today, I have the pleasure of asking some lovely questions to my colleague and friend, Sarah Kleiner. And today we get to talk about Lux and how Lux relates to things like our metabolism, which is a topic that really, really dearly intersects with circadian biology, but no one's really talking about it. And I'm so excited for you to dive into this, to bring this awareness to people. So welcome to the summit, Sarah. Well, Carrie, (laughs) I'm so excited to be here. (laughs) Um, I think that, I think me just saying the word lux for some people is going to be like, what the heck is is that? So, right. So why don't you start at the beginning and, and bring us up to speed? Yeah. So it's often left out of the conversation completely. And I didn't really understand it very well until I started diving deeper into it just in the last six months to a year, really. Um, and then you hear, you, you also hear about it in context alone of using a 10,000, Lux light box, which I want to break down in this conversation as well as like why that's not necessarily appropriate, but it's the amount, it's like the intensity of the light, the brightness of the light. Um, So we talk about frequency. We talk about getting sunrise, UVA, UVB, the importance of those for neurotransmitters, neurohormones, uh, cortisol production, thyroid hormone production, dopamine, you know, all this stuff, uh, serotonin, all of that. Uh, is in response to um, sunrise and UVA light. So those are really important. But what's also important is getting a certain amount of brightness uh, to communicate with the brain as well to turn on the metabolism, prevent seasonal depression. And so this is, again, it's been studied. And what we see is that to get metabolism revved up and to prevent seasonal affective disorder, we really need at least 1300 lux in the morning is what's shown. Uh, and, you know, even getting up to 10,000, of course, that's also been studied, has also been shown to give significant metabolic benefits where there's reduction in BMI reduction or regulation of appetite, because not everyone wants a reduction in appetite. Some people mm-hmm. want to have an appetite in the morning. Right. So there's appetite regulation impact, and then a loss of body fat. These happen with these specific uh, brightness, uh, basically exposing people's eyes to the specific brightness. And so it's kind of this kind of lost and forgotten part of light exposure. And then at night for your body to make melatonin, we often talk about how we want to block the blue and green frequencies because those will tell the brain to continue making cortisol and kick off that sex steroid hormone pathway. But we also need Lux to be at 10 and below the three hours leading up to bedtime for this pineal melatonin to essentially do what it needs to do for it to, for it to start being secreted. And so, and the sleeping environment, one Lux and below. And so, yeah, we talk a lot about blocking blue light and 
getting the right frequencies of light, but we some we forget about the intensity or the brightness or the absence of that in regards to um, supporting metabolism, overall health, really. Oh, amazing. That's super, super helpful. I feel like you just said a whole podcast worth in like three minutes, <laughs> three minutes. Um, so, so, okay. So let's just kind of give some people some awarenesses. And so let's say if I were to wake up and not like go outside and get that brightness stimulation, what would be the, the lux that I'd be exposed to just kind of in an average indoor living space at different times throughout the day? Yeah. I mean, it depends on if you have overhead lights on, if you have super bright lights on, but most indoor lighting, like I don't have it on today. I'm experimenting with just using my window because this thing gives me such a headache, this light in front of my, my desk. But when I have that light on, it'll measure around 400 lux. And that thing is so incredibly bright. Um, most indoor lighting is going to max out and it has to be super bright. It's going to max out around 500 lux. Um, and just average, you know, if I was to measure right here with the window closed, it's probably going to be around 25 lux, you know, so it's pretty dim on the inside. Um, but just going outside, even on a cloudy, rainy day, like I did yesterday, it was cloudy and rainy. And I measured um, with my app, the My Circadian app, the lux outside, and it was 1300 lux, even cloudy, rainy. And it was still in that sunrise window. UV had not even come online yet. And so that brightness that's needed was available even through clouds and a little bit of rain. Perfect. So I think this is the thing too, where, especially where I live, everyone, um, you know, has, a, a, let's say a vast majority of people in the winter have symptoms of mm -hmm. seasonal affective disorder. Mm -hmm. And what I was told probably now 10 or 15 years ago, before I really dove deeper into this circadian biology was that get this 10,000 lux Light box. box, right? Light box. And I had it on my desk, I, at, you know, at the office and I had it kind of angled like maybe, oh, 18 inches away from my face and had it shine into my eyes for 20 minutes during the morning. And I felt um, sure. I think I felt more alert, I would mm -hmm. say, but mm -hmm. I also felt dysregulated. It mm -hmm. was like too much. Mm -hmm. So you know, so as you, so, so can you break down those light boxes and why that might not be the best idea in spite of the fact that there, there's a lot of people recommending those as it's the same thing, it's equivalent to the sun. Um, I'm not going to name names, but it's, it is being mentioned. And so what's, what's the deal with those and why might those not be the best idea for supporting something like SAD? Yeah. I love that question because when you look at those studies, there's three or four of them. I think they're on the My Circadian app website. So um, www.mycircadianapp. I've tried to list the research around luck so people can go read some of these studies, especially when it comes to metabolism, because that's what everyone's concerned about. But in these studies where they're using light boxes, every single one of them, the participants, there are a few participants that report nausea, that report headaches, yes. that report these side effects from using the light boxes because it's a ridiculous amount of blue light. There's no red, there's no infrared, and it's too much. So if you, the one of the reasons why I created the My Circadian app was so people could understand their light environment as a whole, like no wind is sunrise, when is uh, UVA, when is UVB, when is that? And, and then the brightness as well. Um, if you measure the lux around sunrise, depending on if it's a clear day or if it's a cloudy day, it's, you know, somewhere between 500 and a thousand around sunrise. And then it gradually increases. So there's a gradual increase in blue light. There's a gradual increase in intensity. There's a gradual increase in this, you know, the light coming on board. And it just not like a 10,000 lux light box where it's like, I'm just going to blast this level of blue light, not balanced with red, not balanced with infrared, no UV light, which is crucial uh, UV coming into the eye to turn on very specific hormone and neurotransmitters. Um, so all of that is missing. And again, the side effects of the headache, the nausea, uh, your cortisol is going to go up tremendously with that amount of intensity. And it doesn't hit about 10,000 lux until we're really well into UVA. Um, so sun has been up for an hour or so, 45 minutes, an hour. And then as UVA comes online, it'll be 4,000. It'll, it'll climb up gradually. Um, and so that intensity of light is not going to be there until that morning UVA time. And it'll be balanced with, again, near infrared, red, far infrared, like the full, it's full spectrum, right? Today, I have the pleasure of talking with my dear friend and colleague, Carrie Bennett about 
the nervous system and nature, which I am so fascinated by this topic. So yeah, let's just dive right in. Yeah, sure. You know what really, um, I, I had an awareness probably within the past decade or so of the nervous system and its ability to become dysregulated through things like mm-hmm. trauma, um, you know, you know, chronic health journeys. There's a lot of things that I, uh, that I've looked at and I didn't really think that it was in my wheelhouse to support people because there are some beautiful programs out there, such as Irene's, right. Who's on the summit as well in terms of, okay, like there are ways that, that, that people have developed to support the nervous system. But I started getting people who either without doing any other programs start who had nervous system dysregulation simply through implementing the circadian quantum biology strategies that I was teaching, they started to have their nervous system come back into alignment. And also people who had been doing other programs with benefit, who said the icing on the cake that really brought their nervous system into regulation was impact uh, was, was implementing the strategies again that I helped share about things like earthing and sunlight and the Schumann resonance. And so I started to dive into it to be like, okay, what is it about these lighting exposures and exposures to nature that automatically bring the nervous system back into regulation? So I started doing deep dives into what influenced the autonomic nervous system. So for those of you who are unaware of the autonomic nervous system, it's the part of our nervous system that runs in the background that regulates things like our breath rate, our digestion, blood pressure. So the things that we don't have to think about that are just kind of running our physiology. And it turns out that most aspects of modern living can be very dysregulating to this autonomic nervous system, which we can talk about in a second. But the good news is, is that so many aspects of connecting back to certain natural signals again, automatically help to bring our regulation back into rhythm. And so from that, you know, I just got got the inspiration to craft a mini course, which I'm actually, this is the only place that I've I've offered it is if you purchase the upgrade package for this summit. Um, But it really truly brings together my knowledge of the science of why things are dysregulating these days. And then also why and how nature and connecting to nature is the solution to help support your nervous system. Mm, I love that. And it's, it's so empowering, I think for people because it's free, you know, there's, I know you and I have spoken about nervous system regulation and different practitioners we admire and different programs and, but those can be really pricey and the goal of the summit and what you and I are really trying to do on the whole is to provide people with resources and information to um, not have to spend an arm and a leg on uh, these these different programs necessarily. Um, so maybe we can talk a little bit about this connection of uh, Schumann resonance and our nervous system and how that is a contrast to the environment of non-native EMF, flickering lights, all of that. What do those two, how did those two different environments impact the nervous system? I think that's so fascinating. Yeah, I do too. And so the the indoor environment. So I'll, we'll go, we'll we'll go outside, right? Mm-hmm. There's key signals if we are outside in natural light and we're ha- we have bare feet touching the earth, and those signals that we tap into are like the the light, right? The changing light, which you and I talk about frequently. So I don't necessarily have to go a deep dive into that, but it's the changing light frequencies and how that signals our circadian rhythm, but also a stronger connection to the Schumann resonance and the earth's geomagnetic pulse, both of which are signals that are, I would say, kind of drowned out in a mod, in our modern indoor living spaces, we're designed to have those two dominant signals. And I'll talk to you about what they do or that some of the things that they do to support nervous system regulation and just our physiology in general. Um, but the issue is, is that being indoors, number one, I'm not under circadian friendly lighting. So oftentimes I'm going to be in a blue light dominant environment that lacks the UV red and, and near infrared and far infrared for that matter. Mm-hmm. Um, and so my lighting environment is different than nature, but so are the, the other frequencies that I'm exposed to. One frequency that I think is underrated in terms of its ability to dysregulate anyone is flicker coming mm-hmm. from light bulbs. And the, the light bulbs will flicker, these new modern lighting, the new modern light bulbs coming from LEDs, but also fluorescence as well. They, in order to save energy, turn on and off about 100 to 120 cycles per second. 
Now, that's that would be like if you could see it in real time being in a strobe lit club environment, right? Where it's on, off, on, off, on, off. That picture alone of me just picturing my body in that environment would be like, whoa, like I have to get out of here. This does not feel safe to me. And um, while incandescent bulbs did have some flicker associated with them, they didn't flicker in the same what's called amplitude. And so incandescent bulbs had a flicker where they turned a little bit, they, they turned on all the way and then a little bit off and then on all the way and a little bit dimmer, but they never went on, off, on, off. And that's what we see with LED lights from the screens, the bulbs, you know, televisions. Mm -hmm. And so that is truly where I think it's getting more and more dysregulating for, for people. And we can't, because we can't perceive it in real time, it's almost like the feeling of a hidden, the hidden boogeyman. It's like mm -hmm. something feels off about our environment, but we can't pinpoint it because yeah. I can't actually see it in real time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then we combine that with the fact that there's a bunch of non-native EMFs that are just pervasive these days that are very high frequency. We're talking very um, intense uh, in terms of their vibrations and uh, as, uh, compared to things like the Schumann resonance compared to compared to the Earth's geomagnetic pulse. And we are really in an environment that puts our brainwaves in what I would call high beta. We want to talk a little bit about why we both use more red light therapy in the winter really quickly. Yeah, absolutely. You know, come summer, it is so easy for me to pop outside for five minutes here, 10 minutes there, <laughs> take the clothes off or, and, and just soak up the natural light. Right. And I know, I know you do. I know you do the same. And it's beautiful because we're getting all of those um, red and near infrared wavelengths from the sun and imparting all those, um, all those healing benefits from sunlight. But Come, you know, November, December in Michigan, there's very little opportunity for me to do that. It's just too cold, you know? And so I'll go outside and get my light signaling through my eyes, but my skin really, th that, that infrared and red that I want to absorb through my skin is just lacking. And so that's why I would highly recommend if you do, if you live in an environment like that, you consider using a red light therapy panel in the winter. It can be the biggest game changer. Yep. And we both love the Bon Charge Mini. This is super convenient. You can take it with you traveling. Um, I, you know, you guys don't know when I'm recording the podcast, half the time I have it on my low back or somewhere in my body yeah. to mitigate some of this blue light. And for the months of November and December, you can use the code QuantumPod25 from November and December only to get 25% off the panel or anything on the Bon Charge website. Carrie and I are both big fans. Yeah. And I'll, if, one more thing really quickly with that. It's a great gift too, right? If you want oh, to start yes. getting people involved in this lifestyle and say it's the most convenient way, if there's a mom that you know who needs to tend to boo-boos and aches and pains from for kids or earaches, tummy aches, sore throats, it's a phenomenal gift to give as well because it really can wipe away pain very fast. I love it. All right. Check it out. Link is in the show notes. I'm so excited to have today my guest Zaid who is an expert on circadian biology. And uh, we're just gonna, we're just gonna talk about what Zaid thinks is the most important thing for your health and how you implement that with clients, how you teach that. So I'm so excited to have you here. Yeah, likewise, I can't wait for the summit and uh, it's gonna be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I guess we could just start with that question. You know, what is the most important thing that you think people really need to understand when it comes to their health? I would say um, something that I've come across lately and something that I've been exploring a little bit more because um, I've just been, you know, looking for topics to post on social media and whatnot is the connection between artificial light exposure at night, especially and cancer. Um, mm -hmm. I, I found it very interesting that there's one particular paper, I forgot the name of it, but I can definitely reference it in the future for anybody. Um, that they actually show a causative effect of artificial light at night um, on various uh, forms of cancer. And so if you look at the the mechanisms behind that, I mean, we're talking about the destruction of pineal circulatory form of melatonin, which is a potent anti-cancer compound. You're talking about circadian disruption in and of itself, which has been strongly linked. If not, um, there's a causal link to uh, many forms of cancer. And so I think that's something that's always struck me because most people would never assume that the lighting system over, you know, their heads is, is causing some of the, the gnarliest chronic conditions known to man in the form of colorectal cancer or skin cancer, you name it. So that's just something that comes off the, off the top of my head. 
Yeah, I think that's a really important topic, especially since this summit is coming out November and we just had a time change unless you're in Arizona and you're lucky enough not to have to deal with that. But the prevalence, I think, of these hormonal diseases, cancers, metabolic issues, depression, anxiety, they rise in the winter and we have more darkness in the winter and everyone's very obsessed with vitamin D supplementation in the winter. But I think what a lot of people don't understand is this importance of maximizing pineal melatonin and that something as simple as light coming into their room at night or just improperly using light around their house could be a huge factor in these disease prevalences. Yeah. And melatonin in general, I I don't think people appreciate how powerful of a compound it is, how powerful of a hormone it is. It is Mm -hmm. a circadian hormone, meaning, I mean, you have the subcellular form that's stimulated from near infrared light outside during the day. Mm -hmm. Um, That is, I mean, it accounts for what, 90, about 94, 95% of the total melatonin your body produces. Mm -hmm. And then you also have the circulatory pineal form, which gets activated from darkness after sunset. And Mm -hmm. so you can see how melatonin is one of these hormones that is inextricably tied to circadian biology, the light and dark cycle. And it even goes to show how ridiculous some of the like supplementation messaging is on melatonin itself. Um, And so I I don't think people appreciate that at all. Yeah, I would love, I was going to ask you about your, your thoughts on supplementation, because I've used to be like completely anti Um, and I still, for the most part, don't think that people should do that as a first line of defense, but after looking at like Zimmerman Ryder, a lot of that research, there's some interesting information out there, but I'd love to hear your, your take on melatonin supplementation. I mean, this is an area where I'd have to do more research because, um, you have the argument that high dose melatonin offers quite a few benefits. I haven't gone through any of the studies on that, especially on cancer, But then again, we're talking about when somebody actually develops cancer. So when they're past the preventative stage, Um, low dose, I mean, certainly most melatonin supplements are overdosed Mm -hmm. uh, because I think there was a Harvard study that showed that even, um, even in the micrograms, it it should be pretty powerful and active. But uh, I'd say in general, for most people in most scenarios, you don't need to supplement with melatonin knowing what we know about the fact that it is a circadian hormone. And so we always go back to the fact that you should be getting AM sunrise, should be spending as much time as you can outside, sunbathing for a portion of that time. And then, of course, the most important one as well, considering that we have a duality here, is uh, the darkness after sunset. And Mm -hmm. um, if I were to think about, I mean, it's a tough question, like which one is more neglected? Which one is more abused? Is it people not being outside as much or is it people being exposed to artificial light after sunset? And I would have to say it's probably the artificial light after sunset because Mm -hmm. people inherently feel good with sunbathing. And I think the messaging is a little bit better on that end. Um, But either way, I mean, we're still still in quite a predicament when it comes to the messaging. Yeah. And I think in the winter, it gets worse on your point because, you know, you're out there in beautiful, sunny California. I'm here on the gloomy East Coast. I haven't seen the sun in a couple of days here. It's out, but it's just kind of behind the clouds. Uh, And so there's this whole thing of like, "Eh, I don't really want to go outside. It's kind of gloomy. What's the point? That's why I have the, the Lux meter within the app and also try to, you know, cause the Lux is, is bright enough to support metabolism, hormones, all those things. But the other part of going outside on a cloudy rainy day, cause I know a lot of people that are listening might be in that scenario is that it, like you mentioned, the near infrared encourages the subcellular melatonin production. And so I think it's double issue in the winter that we're not respecting darkness and we're also not exposing the body to enough sources of near infrared because people are just going outside less. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. And I think um, if we were to compare maybe summer to winter, yeah, the the impact, the negative impact that people would experience from not only staying inside, but being under artificial light, And then, of course, not knowing that melatonin can bind to the vitamin D receptor, enact some of the same benefits. Um, That's uh, that's something where I think we could throw out some more content and and enhance the messaging because people in general, obviously, the weather has an influence on our psyche, but people in general just stay inside too much, Mm -hmm. especially during the winter time. And I've always found it incredible because, like, during winter when it's cloudy, it's cold, I've inherently always enjoyed that experience. I don't know if a lot of other people have, but there is some 
there is something to say about, you know, getting used to cold exposure, taking your shirt off, starting small. Um, and I, I just think people would experience massive benefits and just improve overall health. I am so excited to have with me today, Mateo, and we are going to talk a little bit about hydrogen, which has been life-changing for me and my family. But I think Mateo has a really lovely spirit. He wants to help people. And uh, so thank you, Mateo, for being here today. Thank you, Sarah. It's absolutely my pleasure and my privilege to be able to speak here with you guys. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the question Carrie and I have been asking everyone for the summit is what do you think is the most important thing people need to understand in order to improve their health? Well, it's a great question and uh, it might be a bit of a bias response, but for me, being the hydrogen warrior and uh, utilizing it for over 12 years, molecular hydrogen therapy, I've found that the most important thing for our health is the health of our cells. Mm -hmm. um, you know, starting at the root cause, and that happens to do with cellular damage or cellular health. And so when we have a um, dysregulation in an organ or a tissue or a system, it starts from the cells first that broke down. Then there's a domino effect. Eventually it led to um, right a dysregulation of this organ or system. So uh, my technology is called the cellular optimizer, and I, I called it that. It's a trademarked, and so that is because it optimizes cellular health. And we do that through molecular hydrogen therapy, which has been scientifically and medically studied and proven to increase cellular health, uh, increase intracellular hydration, protect our DNA, optimize gene expression, and doing all these things on the deepest levels of our core. Um, it's being the, being the smallest molecule in the universe, it gives it the highest bioavailability, meaning it can penetrate our cell walls, it can affect our nucleus in a positive matter, it can pass our blood-brain barrier, it reduces neuroinflammation, it improves cognition, and we've already seen amazing results with stage 4 dementia, uh, Alzheimer's, autism, a lot of different neurological issues, as well as sports performance, uh, actually uh, we have a ranked number one boxer, female boxer in the world. She uses our technology and she just won first place in the uh, wow. world boxing championship for her weight class. So, um, yeah, we are helping a lot of people from two years old to 102 years old and safely and effectively. Yeah, I, I love it. And, you know, I started studying hydrogen and looking into it because my daughter was suffering with a pretty severe autoimmune condition that was essentially attacking her brain. And uh, it was like, hydrogen can bypass the blood brain barrier. It's the smallest molecule. And what if it could help with this really severe neuroinflammation she had? And then she had also been, you know, we did all these functional lab tests that said she had mold. And instead of going to an aggressive detox protocol, because I've seen people do aggressive detox protocols. And I know mold and SIRS and all these conditions are just exploding. They're rampant. And I think it's because people have poor cellular membrane health that these toxins are getting in. They're causing mitochondrial damage. They're causing health issues. And so I'm now, and, I, and I've actually had a couple of people in my private community that have gone to their doctor and said, oh, you have a mold toxicity issue. You need to look into molecular hydrogen. And uh, I kind of intuitively found the hydrogen and yes, my daughter was diagnosed with all these mold issues and now she's not, now she's doing so much better. Uh, we've had so many amazing improvements and, um, it's amazing that doc, some doctors are now catching on to this, but maybe we could talk a little bit about how hydrogen could be therapeutic for somebody who was dealing with something like mold toxicity. Sure. Yeah. So as I'm sure most of us are aware, mold toxicity is very stubborn. It's hard to get out of your body once it's in there. Those those tiny pores, we breathe them in and they start affecting our lungs and our blood and everything like that. And the main thing that happens is it um, damages our immune system. So the beauty with molecular hydrogen is, is that it's been shown to strengthen a weak immune system. So, um, and it can also suppress an overactive immune system. So it acts intelligently for each individual's needs. 
Um, and the, specifically with the mold case, it's been shown to increase the production of glutathione peroxidase and superoxide dismutase, which is our body's natural strongest antioxidants, which helps our body naturally combat uh, a mold toxicity and mold issue. Mm. Um, so it's going to help with the detox, the removal, uh, strengthen the immune system. So your body was designed perfectly to handle these things. But due to toxic burdens and, um, you know, over uh, oxidative stress for extended periods of time, mm -hmm. it, it burdens our body's energy to handle these things. So hydrogen is neutralizing the oxidative stress, which brings down inflammation, which liberates energy. And then there's just this um, world of domino effects that come. And that's why it's been now shown to improve 170 human diseases. Wow. Because just by... Uh, strengthening the immune system, neutralizing oxidative stress, uh, increasing the cell signaling and these things is just a domino effect to the rest of our body and system. Yeah, I, I, it's it's just an intelligent molecule. And that's one of the things I heard Dr. Tyler LeBaron, who he's the one who actually encouraged me to reach out to you earlier this year. And that's why we have connected. And he's the head of the Molecular Hydrogen Institute. I've heard him speak that... Uh, you know, it goes into the mitochondria and it's, it can clean up reactive oxygen species, which these are signaling molecules. We don't want to wipe them out entirely because there's a use for them, right? They're communicating with the body. And what hydrogen does is it does it in this intelligent way so that it's kind of like an adaptogen for these reactive oxygen species. So it leaves the ones that need to be there, there. And it gets rid and kind of cleans up the ones that don't need to be there. I don't know. Did I completely butcher that or is that, is that accurate? No, no, that was perfect uh, because it, it it acts like an intelligent and a selective antioxidant. Mm -hmm. Hydrogen itself is not actually an antioxidant, but it, it has all the properties of an antioxidant. Mm -hmm. And so um, you said it perfectly. It selectively neutralizes certain oxidants, harmful mm -hmm. ones, and leaves other as signaling molecules, so it can continue to do what it needs to do. It improves electron flow in the mitochondria, and uh, which we have a better functioning mitochondria, we have better ATP production, we have better energy, and the body uh, functions a lot better. And so mm -hmm. some of the world's top doctors, they only focus on mitochondrial health. Mm -hmm. And so we know, and it's been proven, hydrogen helps mitochondria. Mm -hmm. 